Welcome back to your live continuing Teradek NAB 2015 coverage here from the Las Vegas Convention Center in Las Vegas, Nevada. I'm Michael Artsis. Thanks so much for joining us for this live continuing coverage of NAB, the National Association of Broadcasters Convention. It's a lot of fun. You know, Teradek is a Vitek brand. It's, it's a really great company, Vitek. They have Manfrotto and Sackler and they have light panels. The list goes on and on. Small HD power links. It, it never ends. Anton Bauer, I feel like I never give Anton Bauer enough love because they really are the standard for camera batteries in the industry and they power lights, they power all sorts of stuff. They're the best. They really are, without a doubt. We use Anton Bauer all the time. In fact, exclusively, that's all we use unless something doesn't take an Anton Bauer battery and then we try to use a plate and adapt it. But if not, sometimes you can't. I can't use an Anton Bauer battery for my laptop yet, but someday I'll be able to. Um, so I've got Scott here from another Vitek brand, and that is Bexel, and you guys do Bexel Integrated Systems. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Talk about um, what Bexel Integrated Systems does, because Bexel is such a large company in the Vitek brand, and it really covers so much stuff. Uh, you guys do, you have a rental business, you have uh, a production business, and then integration. Talk about the integration part. Sure, we're part of what we now call Bexel Global Services, or Global Broadcast Services. And the division that I'm responsible for is Bexel ESS, which is Engineered Systems and Solutions. And we are, basically what we take is what we do on a temporary basis for a lot of our large clients, which are production control rooms, uh, infrastructure builds, which are fiber optics or uh, copper cable plants, and other aspects of broadcast technology and put them in place in a permanent installation. So that's how we're a little different from the RSS group. Uh, that is, uh, that's awesome. I mean, I, I think that it's so important to, for, for you, for guys to be able to call you guys and get their problem solved, to get you guys to show up on location and do what they need. Yeah, and one of the unique things about what we bring to the table is because we use the equipment and we kind of have that, that end user um, feel and application, when we're working in, uh, we do a lot of design build work where clients come to us to help them build specialty systems, um, whether it be replay or uh, player tracking and some of the other things that we've done for some of the various leagues um, around the country and the world, is we bring a different perspective than your typical uh, consultant or even integrator because we've worked with the gear before. Well, I think it's because you also, not only have you worked with the gear, you do work with the gear. For instance, mm -hmm. I know that on the production side, you guys did the US Open last year. Mm -hmm. And um, and then you did this a CBS show, uh, I forget the name of it, but it was done in, in, in some jungle somewhere, and you guys cabled the entire jungle and ran cue ball oh. cameras and all sorts of other cameras. Well, maybe it, it may have been a Fox show and was Utopia. You're right, it was Utopia and Fox. I've been saying CBS all day. That's all right, it's not on the air, so neither one of them probably wants to take credit for it. There you go, but <laughs> it was Utopia and that was uh, challenging, but yeah. because of that, it makes, like you said, it makes what you guys do as an integrator so much stronger and so important. Yeah, I think that it, it, it ups the level of confidence because we felt their pain and we understand what, it, what they need and when they need to have it. And when they look at a company like Bexel, they can say, well, you know, that guy who's installing that or building out this control room, he sat in that chair. So he knows what it's going to need and he has the experience. And, and that you know, brings a lot of the credibility to Bexel as a whole across well, all of it, our divisions. And it's not only, I, I think the other, th it's not only, you're right, you're so right, but it's not only about the credibility because it's, again, it just goes back to the fact that like I've seen so many times you walk into a place and they'll go, oh yeah, we hired a consultant. Why are you using that? Well, we hired a consultant, he picked that and that and that. And in theory, they work together, right? They should. Mm -hmm. This is a, I don't know, let's say, this is a video switcher, this is a video replay system, and this is your uh, satellite, right? Mm -hmm. But the reality is maybe those products don't actually work well together, or the workflow is crazy, or the workarounds are crazy, and you know, you know what? Realistically, you'd be better off doing this, this, and this. Even maybe it's a little bit more money to spend, but you're going to save so much in uh, in productivity or workflow that you, this is the you way you hit to do a it. great point there. In the design of any system, um, there's that there's kind of three components. There's the technical component of what you're trying to accomplish. There's the workflow that's a part of that. There's the budget that you have available to you, and then there's the products that are available to fulfill that need. And we like to say that we're agnostic, even though we're part of the Vitek group, we work with a lot of vendors outside of um, the Vitek group, and we try and find the best product solution that fits across the board 
for all of their needs. Because sometimes you can come across a product, it's a great product that fits the needs, but they can't afford it within their budget. Or that it doesn't take, uh, what we look at a lot is trying to future-proof our clients and to be able to build on the systems that they have. Isn't that the hardest part, future-proofing? Uh, because number one, we don't necessarily know we know what's around the corner, but we don't know what's two or three years out. And you and you know, it used to be, I, I remember this, you'd buy, let's say you'd buy an ENG camera kit for your, your, mm -hmm. your reporters, they'd go out, right? That ENG kit literally would last 10 years. You know, maybe it takes some repairs, but it was a workhorse, it was tough. Uh, the, the Anton Bauer batteries would last forever. The uh, tripods would last forever. Now, the tripods and the batteries still last forever, but the cameras are being replaced you know, in two or three years tops and have to be. But sometimes when you can find ways that say, you know what, this camera also shoots 4K or it does 8K already, so we're yeah. thinking that far ahead, you might not be using it today, but spend the extra money now so you're not replacing it. That, we hit both sides of that. It, it's really important in our consulting side of our business for us to accurately represent how the client's spending their money for both protecting them from the future uh, changes as well as things that they may want not to protect themselves from and say, you know what, it's a throwaway. And in three years you're going to go some other way and be able to have the knowledge base and the expertise to know where to recommend one over the other. It's an important part because when you're spending millions and millions of dollars as most uh, control rooms or, or studios or uh, large broadcast projects are, it's important that they have the knowledge base and the steps of a ladder, if you want to look at that, that here we're going to be building towards this future. So maybe this year we're not going to invest in 4K, but we're going to put in a 4K router because we don't want to spend a million dollars on another router. So we're going to use our existing uh, cameras, HD cameras, but we're not going to go full 4K, but the infrastructure has to be able to support 4K. Right. So we look at the various different components and say, okay, what things aren't going to change? And you should really beef that up to take you to where you need to go and where your future plans are going, and what things, is it too hard to look in the crystal ball and really give you an accurate assessment? What do you think will be the biggest change in the future? I mean, I always look at like SDI cables and I go, you know, they've kind of been around a while. Are they going to still be around in five, seven years? Or are we going to find a new connector or a new cable that's even better? Or are we going to be completely wireless? I, I think we're all going to go back to an old connector, <laughs> which, which is the RJ45. Really? It's the ethernet connector. Right. It, Everything is IP. So when the, the, the industry's transitioning. It's not a crazy idea because number one, you could do P, P, uh, you know, you could power over, uh, over ethernet. You could uh, definitely transmit data over ethernet. Yep. And it's, everything's it's becoming like, data. Right. Every, if you look at the routers, there's IP-based routers, there's IP-based cameras. There, everything is moving to IP. Uh, your, your storage, your media asset management, your sales systems, your trafficking systems, they're all IP-based these days. So I think, you know, I might be wrong, but we, I think we're going back to a simpler connector that's been around for 25, 30 years, maybe longer. Can it carry it. enough data to do a video transmissions and I mean on the high end and the high level? It depends, it depends. Okay. Um, the RJ45 I think will be a, a short haul connector mm -hmm. in, 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 small, in small studio environments. Ideally, and quite frankly, where Bexel and my division cut its teeth is in the fiber optic world. And so what I think is you're going to see, and maybe that's even wrong to say that it's the RJ45, it might be the SC or LC connector sure. from fiber opt in the fiber optic world because everything, the, the copper connections can't really push the bandwidth. The manufacturers, obviously they want to sell equipment, so they keep making the equipment faster, better, be able to provide more bandwidth on a, sta they don't want you to have to replace your infrastructure every time you upgrade a new piece of gear. So I think, RJ45 and copper uh, connectivity will be around for a while, but really in the studio, if I was building a studio and I was future-proofing it, between my control room, uh, my machine room, and all my various places where I have equipment, I'd be building in a very robust optical infrastructure because that, beyond a doubt, will be able to support anything we bring forward in the future. Why is it taking so long to get fiber optic uh, technology really into uh, studios and newsrooms and all of that, and, and really into our lives in general. I mean, it's, it's been only the last like five years that fiber optics has been pushed into our homes as, as, a, as a cable alternative. And, uh, and, and we see it in the real world because, I mean, fiber optics has been around forever. You know, it's interesting. I, I look at fiber optics and it's such a simple medium. It's light traveling down a piece of glass. It's not impacted by all of the, 
uh, EMI and RF and all these other things that can uh, impact copper cabling. When we used to do uh, data communications installations, you have near-end cross tank far end crosstalk. All of these different things that can happen by putting copper cables next to each other or next to an AC line. Optical cable is impervious to all of that. So you would wonder, why didn't people embrace it sooner? And I think there's two reasons. One is the use of uh, diodes and lasers for single mode fiber was just cost prohibitive. But now that so many things are becoming optically enabled, it's just like a 70 inch television. Used to be you wanted a 65, 70 inch television, it was going to cost you 10 grand. Now you can run out to your local retailer and it's $1,500. Right. Why? Because they, they can build the panels more effectively, uh, more cost effectively with less errors and they can build larger sets quicker, faster, and there's m simply a larger market for it. So you're seeing fiber to the home, so now you have optical ena enabled devices. If you look at the receiver that sits in your stereo system, yeah. there's probably an optically enabled port on the back of it. 10 years ago you didn't have that. So I think part of it is just the market size has grown and therefore the price has come what down. What about the fragility of the cable? Is, is, is fiber optic, uh, is it fragile? I've, I've heard this before and I think Mercedes years ago, about eight years ago, put fiber optics uh, to their brakes and their brake lights and wound up taking them out of e their E-Class, they put it in their E-Class, and they wound up taking it out in the next generation of the E-Class because they felt that it was too fragile. Um, and that's the argument I've always heard, the only argument I've ever heard against fiber optic other than the cost. I, you know, it's the biggest mystery to me because fiber optics, yes, in its raw state, a piece of glass is, is, is fragile. But you can take that, you can take a fiber optic and wrap it around your finger and, and it, it'll be just fine. You could, you could bend it down almost to the point of breaking it, and it won't break. Uh, so it, it's incredibly du durable and incredibly resistant to uh, damage. And again, it, does, it, it doesn't have all those mechanical properties that impact copper. Water, per se, is not a big issue for fiber optics. We, we have under, undersea cables, and we, we, we don't have just all the same issues. So I think that's a misnomer. And where it really came from is in the early days of fiber optics, there was a misunderstanding of what it was. And I remember on some of our early installations, we would put in a fiber backbone, and the client would come and say, the fiber's not working. And I would say, oh yes it is. And they said, no it's not. And I go, well let's be clear on what's not working. And we'd go and test the fiber link end to end, just the cable, and it was working fine. The, the equipment wasn't working, because at the time, the equipment was still a bit of a science experiment. Sure. But they put everything in, the fiber isn't working. And so it got a little bit of a bad rap, but the, the bottom line is a fiber is a very robust technology, and if it wasn't, it wouldn't have been used by telecommunications industry for the last 50 to 60 years. You know, I think you're so right about fiber and, and, and its future use, and I got to tell you, um, I was at New York One as an anchor and reporter, uh, New York's 24-hour news station, mm -hmm. and I helped launch the, their bureaus, their New Jersey, Staten Island, the Brooklyn, all, all these different bureaus that they have and they laid fiber to all the bureaus. They spent a ton of money, we're sure. talking 2003. But I'll tell you, the, the uh, information passed through was, in, it was instantaneous mm -hmm. uh, back then. We would literally be uh, passing video clips back and forth, we'd be able to uh, look at what they were editing. It was unreal uh, what we were able to do back then. And I think each, I, I think the number was like a million dollars for each fiber run from New York City to like, New Jersey for the Jersey Bureau, from New York City to like Staten uh, Island. Uh, it certainly could have been. Yeah. You know, there's a, I don't know if the figure's exactly right, but uh, I'll quote it. You can have up to 20,000 simultaneous telefo telephone conversations two way, and it might be 200,000, on a single strand of fiber. Wow. Okay, so we haven't even really pushed the upper limits of single mode fiber, which is the most dominant type we use in television and broadcasting, of what it can really do. And so I think from a technology standpoint, it's going to continue to grow. And years ago when they were putting in that fiber, like you said, for New York One, there was probably, there was a time in the optical business when all the telecommunications companies were putting in fiber, and uh, Anschutz was doing it up and down the uh, railroad lines to build his network out, which became AEG. Um, you had Comcast, you had AT&T, you had everybody putting in fiber. There was a de such a high demand on fiber you couldn't find it, and so the cost skyrocketed. And that was right around the time it started coming into play in television, and one of the reasons everybody looked at it is, oh, it's very, very expensive. Well, 
you'd call and you'd order, order up fiber and it would be six months to get a piece and you know at a very high cost. Now, it's in pa on par with the cost of copper cabling and in some cases, less expensive. That is excellent. I could talk to you all day. This is such a fascinating conversation. You have such great insight and information and I think it just it just speaks volumes about what you guys do and really showcases what Bexel integration is all about. And I think it's phenomenal. So I think everybody's got to check out Bexel integration, but also Bexel in general for Absolutely. all the different areas. Scott, thank you so much for joining us and taking the time to you know, share with our viewers all this great information and, and share about Bexel integration. Thank you, Global thank Services. you for having me. Bexel Global Services. All right, I'm Michael Artsis. This is your live continuing Teradek NAB 2015 coverage from the Las Vegas Convention Center in Las Vegas, Nevada. We'll be back with a whole lot more right after this. Don't go anywhere.